now I want to share a message with you, and this, uh, the title of my message is Revival. And I pray that the Lord will touch you because I really want to share something from my spirit to your spirit that He will just bless you. So let's ask the Lord's blessing and be expectant to hear what God has to say. Father, please bless our hearts and help us to understand your word. Um, speak from your spirit to our spirits and communicate to us in such a way that it'll spark a fire, it will ignite a light that comes from you. We pray and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen? Now, um, we would like to talk about revival, and I would like to ask if you can be so kind to read together with me. If I hope you can see, can you see this? Yes, okay. Maybe we stand as we read the Scriptures together. I think it's nice to be able to read it together. Let's read from verse 1. Lord, you have been favorable. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let's read. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all sin. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from your fierceness of your anger. Restore us, O God, of our salvation and cause your anger to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what the Lord will speak, for He will speak peace to His people and to His saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely His salvation is near to those who fear Him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will grant what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before Him, and shall make His footsteps our pathway. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. This psalm, I want to just focus on one particular verse, but without... Um, you know, uh, taking away what is in the psalm and the richness of the psalm. Psalms were written by different authors. You see, the Bible um, is actually a collection of books. The Bible, uh, we you get the word Bible from the word biblios, which actually means a library. Every time we look at the Bible, the Old Testament for us, uh, which is the Jewish Bible called the Tanakh, uh, it's basically a combination of the law, the prophets, and the, and the writings or the Psalms. And then the New Testament we have uh, in us, again, is a collection of, of books. And in this uh, time in the Bible, when you have this collection of books, you'll find that the Psalms were written as uh, in a period. Actually, scholars, this particular Psalm 85, the scholars kind of disagree with each other as to exactly when was this psalm written. Um, in the time of, of, of civilization, when we take, uh, go back years, you'll find that there was a period in, this, in, the, in the cradle of civilization by the river Euphrates. You had the Mesopotamia and you had Egypt and, and that in Canaan, uh, or Canaan, which is where Israel uh, happened to have uh, been a very small little country that established there, there were people who worshipped all kinds of different gods. And usually the gods that they worshipped, there was a reason for it. They, they worshipped the gods of, 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 the, of the rain, for example, the gods of the wind, the gods of, of, of light, the gods of fire, the gods of mountain. There were people who worshipped different kinds of gods in, in that time. And when Israel uh, was, was born, they were, they were different because they were not worshipping these items. They were worshipping 
a God whom they believed was above and beyond the elements around them. And Israel's relationship at that time when there were people worshipping many different gods, Israel's relationship with God was such that they believed in one God, one only God. And it was not based on, on just worshipping an item, but it was based on a relationship that a nation had with this one God. And how did they know the relationship? It was often in history, every time they looked back and they saw the way God led them and God guided them, they were able to see that He has been there, He was with us. It was not by super man and super woman. All the people in the Bible, in the Old Testament, when you, when, you, when you look at it and you read it, you'll find that they're very normal people, just like you and me. If they were here today, for example, if you had Prophet Jeremiah or, or Isaiah or if you had Ezekiel among the congregation, you wouldn't even notice them. Maybe they might, have, they might dress a little bit weird uh, compared to us, but uh, they were just ordinary men, just like you and me. If there's someone sitting near, near you, turn and look at that person and say, you could be one of those prophets. <laughs> the person right next to you or one of those writers. Because you, you couldn't recognize them. The difference was they had a relationship, a living relationship with God. And because they had a re living relationship, their, their spirit was connected to the spirit of God. There was this spiritual relationship between them and God. The mighty God, the almighty, the real God. He was not just... A king. He was king of all kings. He was the Lord of all lords. He was the most high God. Hallelujah. It's awesome. That was the kind of relationship they were connected to. And so, in a time, in fact, Israel was, was, you know, when they finally went into the land of Canaan, they, they inherited the promised land given to them by God. There were 12 tribes spread all over the, 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 the landscape. And in, time, in, in the course of time, there was a division between them. They became the northern tribes and the southern tribes. There were ten tribes in the north, which was called Israel at that time. Uh, and then the, the, the two tribes in the south, which was called Judah. And because Israel had uh, sort of, you know, turned away from God again and again, they had different people who conquest them. Finally, the Assyrians came, and the Assyrians totally and just destroyed them. Completely, and he, the, the whole nation was just totally gone, and the people somehow assimilated into the cultures and the different uh, conquerors that came and, and, and just disappeared from history. But the southern tribe, Judas, the two tribes, they decided to stay with God, and they decided to be faithful with God. And it wasn't until the, the Babylonian captivity, because they, they, they were faithful to God, and then they dis disobeyed his laws. They were faithful, and then they disobeyed. And then from time to time, God sent different prophets, and finally, when uh, God sent uh, Jeremiah and said, it's over, it's, it's over. Now, I'm upset, I've given you so much of time, I need to step back, and my wrath is going to be revealed. And so finally, the Babylonian captivity came, and they were taken away to Babylonia for 70 years, they were in captivity. But they didn't forget their God. They remembered their God. They sang songs in the land of captivity about their God because they could remember history. They could remember they were just ordinary people, just like you and me. But their God made a difference. Their God. And so when the psalmist was writing this song, uh, he, the, the, the historians and, and scholars are, are kind of wondering, where do we put this? Do we put this in 1000 BC or, or 900 BC? They, they were not very sure whether before the captivity, after, you know, and there's debates over this. And, and it was the sons of Korah, they are like the song leaders, like Andy and the team that was here today. You know, and the psalmist, some believed uh, that David was the psalmist. It was written for the sons of Korah, given it to them and said, sing this. And there are a lot of things mentioned in this word. I don't want to go into all the details, but one thing I really want to focus our attention on this morning is that one verse in verse 6 where, where the psalmist says, revive us again. Revive us again. In order to say revive, it, 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 it has to do with come back to life. Bring us back to life. You see, because there are 
the, the, the relationship that Israel had with their God, it was not a religion. In fact, when you take the Tanakh, which is the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament, there's, there's no word religion. They didn't have the word religion. Today, we have the word religion. We, we say, what's your religion? We say, oh, I, I'm a Christian, I, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Hindu, and, and you go on back and forth. It, it, for them, it was not, it was not a, a religion. It was my relationship my relationship. And so that relationship, when it was there, the spark was there, the connection was there between them and God. And when that was gone, they came back to the promised land. They've been captivities. And they says, oh God, revive. Bring back to life that which I used to have. And it's gone. And they said, revive us again. Can everybody say revive? revive? Say it as if you are revived. Revive. <laughs> Come on. Revive. revive. Say it again. Revive. revive. And say revive again. Revive. Yes. That's what they were saying. And this word revive, I want to show you. It's very interesting. The Hebrew word revive is the word Chaya, which is basically translated revive in, in English, it has so many meanings. You'll be amazed. Look at the different meanings it has. First of all, it's to keep or to live or to make alive. Hallelujah. And it also means to give or to promise life. To revive is to give you life or to promise you life. To revive means to let live not to let it die. Uh, we have got many uh, flowers at, at our home. Um, Lillian has a speciality in, in orchids. Orchid happened to be our national flower in Singapore. Very difficult to, to, to keep, actually, because if you, you, if you overwater them, they die. If you don't give them enough water, they die. You need to just give them the right amount of water and the right amount of lights, and it looks like it's dead almost all year round, to be honest. And it's just a certain season, suddenly it starts to come alive. And in order for it to be alive, we have to keep the right water. So sometimes we travel, when we travel for more than a week or two, I, I can tell Lillian, I said, most likely some of these plants are dead. Even though we ask somebody to come and take care of the house and water, you need to know how to water them. And, and if you water them the right way, they will live. If you don't, they will die. How many of you, you know, have green fingers? I, I don't mean literally green fingers. I mean, you know, you, you, you are very good with plants. Is there anybody here? Oh, we have two. Wow. Marina's mother all the way from Ukraine. Green, Ukraine green fingers. <laughs> now, it, it takes skill to let live. And revive has to do with that keeping it alive, let it live. Revive has to do with to nourish up. Nourish up is, to, is the same when you have a good meal and you feel, ah, I'm nourished. I've got the vitamins and the minerals in my system. So we're, we're not talking about the body here, but it's more about the spirit, but, but the concept, the idea. We go further to revive means to, to preserve um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the northern parts of the world where the climate is usually cold, when you have distinct four seasons, it's very common to preserve food so that you can use it at a time when it's needed. You harvest during the harvest time and you preserve it so that during winter it's available. The, that concept of preserve has to do with revive. And to quicken, to quicken is to, to, to wake up. That's why the Bible says that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. And it says, He will quicken your mortal bodies. That's why when your spirit is, is charged, something happens to your body. It's very difficult to have your spirit charged and have your body so dignified. It's impossible. Something happens, you just feel like, whoa, something is going on. It's like charging your battery in your phone. When you take your phone and you realize that the, the battery is low and it's about time to be charged, you have to charge it. And then it's ready to be used again. It quickens the phone, it quickens your body. And we, to, to, to revive also is to recover, to get back, bring back what uh, it used to be, to restore it to its order, to repair, to repair. 
during, uh, for those of you who live in a, uh, houses or apartments, during this period of the year, in the spring, light comes and you start to see all the cracks in the walls and things that need to be repaired. It used to be a way, now you bring it back to what it used to be. Now, also to restore to life, to bring back to life. And um, I remember one of my friends, uh, when we were in Mission Field in Uganda, he and his wife, uh, they got a, a pet monkey, a little monkey, and they called the monkey Reuben. It was a very tiny little monkey. Uh, you know that friend of mine, actually? His name is Ricky. He used to be, he ever visited us before. And that little monkey would always sit on his shoulder here, and, and Serene, uh, and they really took care of that little monkey as their pet. They would go out to the, uh, you know, to the f people and talk about the uh, Bible and so on. They would come back and they would feed little Reuben and take good care. And one day, there was an accident. Reuben was uh, taken out of the house and, 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 and tied, tied around uh, the hand or, or the body or something and left aside so that they could clean up the cage before they brought him in. And some accident took place and Reuben got entangled in his own rope and kind of hung himself and actually literally died, meaning he stopped breathing. He was so disappointed, Ricky and, and, and Serene. They were like, oh my God, what would we do? And they just couldn't accept that their little pet monkey had died. And Ricky and Serene did something that I possibly wouldn't done. Don't worry, they didn't give the monkey mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, uh, in, in case you're wondering. <laughs> no, they didn't do it. <laughs> what they did was they brought the little monkey into the uh, room and they were so affected and they prayed over Reuben. They prayed. Reuben was dead. He died, literally. I mean, like, stopped breathing, you know, stiff. And so he was gone. And so they took Reuben into the room and they started to pray over Reuben and said, Oh God, please don't, you know, let. And suddenly a miracle took place. Reuben came back to life. Seriously. That monkey resurrected. Honestly, I was like, I couldn't believe these guys actually brought the monkey back to life. So I'm telling you, if you don't want to die and, you, and you're really dying, invite Ricky and Serene to come and pray for you. <laughs> if it works for a monkey, it probably might work for you. <laughs> brought back to life, man. I'm telling you, my goodness. We had a lot of wonderful experience in Africa. But, you know, and it's also to save to save because if something is about to die, you try to save. That's what revive, revive, and or to be whole, to be whole. So there are many words in this, in this one word, revive, and the psalmist who wrote that, they, they, they were remembering that, Lord, it seems to us now, it feels like you have turned your back, you, you have moved away from us, and, but we remember there was a time, there was a time when you revived us, when we were connected, our relationship was not broken, it was not severed, we were together, but it's gone. Now we are asking, oh God, revive us, bring us back to, to that stage where we were connected, where there was a connection between us and you. Are you following me? You know, that cry does not come from your, your body. It doesn't come from your soul. You see, we, as we look around at us today, you, you, what you see is just a, a tent. You see a body. You see flesh and bone. The real you and me is not this flesh. The real me and you is the spirit. We are a spirit. God is spirit. Those who worship him, have to worship Him in spirit and in truth. When God created Adam and Eve, He created them as spirit. We have a soul. Our soul is our feelings, our, our will. Sometimes we are very you know, strong-willed in certain areas. Our, our emotions, our, our thought patterns, that's our soul. Our soul is being saved. And our, our body is what we are living in. So we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. Does this make any sense? You see, so when, when we're talking about revival, when you're talking about coming back to, to, to that relationship, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, when God said, don't eat of the fruit that I told you not to, otherwise you're going to die. That wasn't a physical death. That was a spiritual death. There was a spiritual, sev they were severed from God. That brought about separation. That broke the relationship. And Christ came to restore that relationship. And whenever we, we, we are coming back to God, it's 
it's not our bodies, it's our spirit crying out. And when that connection is gone between us and God, that's when we feel He has turned away. I, I don't sense Him. I don't feel He's there, even though He's there. And God's inviting us always saying, come, come, come. Every time we turn our backs, it is not God who turns away from us. Most of the time, it is us who turn from God. Even though when we came to meet God, you might think, you know, I found God. You honestly didn't find God. He found you. He knew you from your mother's womb. Even from the foundations of creation, He saw you and He knew you. Hallelujah. Are you with me? And so, when we're talking about this spiritual connection and revival, it is saying, God, revive us, connect us, put us back to where we're supposed to be. And this revival can take place anytime, anywhere, when you want. Now, in conclusion, let me just say these few things. Revival goes back even before the Garden of Eden. In case you're wondering, oh, it was in the Garden of Eden that God breathed life. You see, when, when God breathed life into a person, his soul wakes up. Even before the Garden of Eden, revival started because you see, sin didn't originate in the Garden of Eden. It happened in heaven way before even God created earth where Lucifer and one third of his angels rebelled against God. After they rebelled against God, God realized that this is not good. Now I have to do something good. And I'm going to shake the heavens and I'm going to shake the earth. And that is when, when he, the, in the recreation of the earth, he said everything is good. Everything is good. Why did God say everything is good? You have to compare good with bad. If there was something bad. And then, because Adam, God said, we have to start all over again. We have to start all over again. Adam and Eve, God started, God breathed. He wanted a relationship with them. They had this relationship every cool of the day. God would meet them and talk to them. And revival goes way back to then. Now, revival can be personal, it can be national, it can be global. Personal was that relationship God has with you and me. National was what the psalmist was referring to. They said, we remember once upon a time as a nation, we worshipped you, but now we turned away from you. We had an experience sometimes in the 80s uh, in Singapore where I was born and raised together with uh, my wife. Uh, most of us in Singapore are, are not necessarily Christians. In fact, the majority are Buddhists. The majority are, Ch are Chinese. Then you have Hinduism, you have uh, Buddhism, you have Islam, you have Christianity, you know, people just go to church and we do our own things. We live very nice, good with each other, we, we are friends. But somewhere around the 80s, something happened to Singapore. Something supernatural happened, my friends. People were just turning to Christ through supernatural experiences. I was one of those. I had a vision of a cross, I found myself in a church. There was this spark, there was a, there was a hunger we could not help but wanted to be in the presence of God. We, the church was just packed with people and 90%, 90, 95% of the people who just turned to Christ because there was a revival. Our spirits were sparked. We were hungry. We, were, we had many services. We had morning service, afternoon service, evening service, and we had classes in between. Many of us spent the whole day in church. The whole day. And, and, remind, and bear, you, uh, bear in mind that every service they collected offerings, so by the end of the service you were broke. <laughs> and we didn't complain. We didn't complain. In fact, some of us walked home. We used to take you know, buses and, and public transport. Some of us walked home. It was, we just wanted to be in the presence of God. Our spirit was hungry. We were just soaking in the, the, the presence of God. It was like, Wow, our spirits were touched. Something happened in that time. And when that happened, it, it spread. In, in fact, the nation today in Singapore, you have some of the largest churches uh, in Southeast Asia, big, huge churches, not just the size, but the whole nation was blessed. Economically, Singapore is, is one of the best economies right now in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's, it's awesome. In fact, they're saying today that uh, people used to hide their money in, 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 in Switzerland before. They say now Singapore is a better place to hide your money. <laughs> if you have a lot of money, put it in Singapore. If you don't know how to bring it, give it to me, I'll bring it there for you. <laughs> but uh, it, it, there's a connection, there's a direct connotation between 
being blessed spiritually, individually, and, 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 and I believe a global revival will take place. And this gro- global revival that will take place one of these days, it's not going to be about religion. It's going to be going back to the basics, back to what the Tanakh was all about. It's about us having a relationship with God. Revival. Hallelujah. Amen. Look at this. To be born again is to be revived. That's what being born again is all about. Born again is not about some, you know, baptism, some certificate, some huge... It's, it's good. It, it includes it. It's, it's part of it. But really, what does it mean to be born again? Again. Are you with me? To be born again. It means that you're, you're born naturally, but now you're born spiritually. That's what Jesus came to do. Your spirit is connected back to God. Hallelujah. Amen. That's, what it means. That's why the Bible says, you know, in Matthew 5, 6, this is my second last scripture. I'll give you one more, and then we'll close, and I'll just add on some, some thoughts about this right after that. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be denied. Is that what he says? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be Filled. You must have a personal hunger and a thirst. God, I want you. Today, you know, I'm not talking to your, to your heads. I'm really talking to your spirits. And, and we are at different levels in our, in our spiritual growth, and that's just the way it is. Some of your spirits are maybe very contented where you are, but some of your spirits are, have, been, have been turned on, has been sparked, has been switched on, and you have this hunger. I pray to God that You'll be, your spirit will be touched somehow this morning to, to carry on that spark. I'll give you a last scripture before I close. In, in Psalm 80, 86 and verse uh, 85, rather, in verse 6, this is what the uh, uh, psalmist said. He said, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? We are his people. And the psalmist said, as he, he said, will you not chaya? Will you not... Turn us on. Will you not spark it? Why? So that we can rejoice in you. We can be happy with you. So that we can have that wonderful experience we used to have before. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, we'll just close in a word of prayer for the sake of the recording, and then I'll, I'll, I'll just carry on and share something extra with you. Lord, we just want to pray that you will touch our hearts and uh, bless us. Help us, Lord, in the name of Jesus, to be revived in our spirits. And I pray for those watching and those listening that you will, in the name of Jesus, turn our spirits on and let it ignite with the fire from your altar, the fire of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a journey that we take together. It's soul food from the heart. In God, we're united in our differences. It's a place of getting in touch with God, others, and your destiny. Come and visit ICC, the international Christian community, a church where great things come together.